Natasha, we're glad that you're with us. And um, uh, I am certainly excited about uh, today, not because I'm the presenter, but because I'm excited every time that this class gets together. I am moved by the conversations we have. I um, extend that today to you to um, certainly give your thoughts. We don't always agree, um, but I will say this, that we have done a, a wonderful job and no doubt that we have a wonderful instructor who helps us spread our wings and I appreciate that. So. Today we're talking about the silence of the lambs, and um, I'm going to take my time today, and I'm going to I'm going to pause so that you've got time to come in and say what you want to say. Do not um, worry about interrupting me. I, I'll get my thought back, believe it or not. I think it's really exciting that we have such a diverse group of people not only in age, but also in uh, maybe our backgrounds, what we think, what we like. So let's dive in and see what we can do today with this extraordinary film, The Silence of the Lamb. First of all, it was a film uh, that was presented to us in 1991 um, based on a book by Thomas Harris. Uh, something very intriguing here about this, I believe, um, we know the movie is great and it's exhilarating and all those things. Um, but this uh, movie has a twist to it, a psychological twist. And in this movie, we have the opportunity to almost play one of the parts. So Silence of the Lamb is still a favorite of film goers for the last 30 years. It has been so popular. And it was so popular when it was released uh, that it received five Academy Awards. And I have those listed. Uh, Best Picture, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Best Actress in a Leading Role, uh, Jodie Foster. Best Director, uh, Jonathan Demme. Best Screenplay, Ted Salem. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to make this uh, comment that I was watching a interview by uh, that Jodie Foster was in and she made the comment that her and Anthony Hopkins did not have a normal conversation all the time that they filmed this. And the person that was doing the interview asked her why and she said, I was afraid of him. So he really did put the, um, the character in play, and we'll get to him in a little more. We're gonna talk about a couple of the actors here for the next 10 minutes or so. But before we get to that, I'd like to say this, that I, I'm intrigued by filmmaking now. I wasn't before, but it's almost like a team sport. You know, you've got your people that are the star players, but you've also, in filmmaking, you've got the field, you've got the uh, coaches, you got the equipment, and of course we can relate that to the cameras, the uh, the missing scene. We can we can look at all of those things. So it's important not only to have great actors, but to also to have a directors and people that uh, do the cinema in order to bring all those things around. Um, good teams win, and good uh, productions make great movies. Jody Foster is her real name is Alicia Christian Jody Foster is an American actress, director, producer. Um, she's played, uh, of course, in movies such as uh, Taxi Driver and The Accused. She won an Academy Award for her, her, her role here as Carrie Car Starling. And Starling, as you'll see in the, in the handout that I gave you, we're going to look and see what her actress, what her uh, actor portrays. Uh, she is going to be a student FBI agent. And if you'll notice her, she's a little shy. She's not really sure of herself in some things. And she has that awesome country dialect. 
she's a pretty young lady, but she's living in a man's world. Uh, she is called upon to gather information from Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychiatrist who is also a vi violent psychopath. He's serving a life sentence for various acts of murder and other things. The other leading role was Anthony Hopkins. By the way, he is one of my top five actors of all time. Uh, and I go back to liking people, you know, uh, that are older. But uh, Hopkins is a Welsh actor. Um, he has been a recipient of multiple awards, um, Academy Award, of course, for this film. And uh, he's even got the C uh, Cecil B. DeMille Award. And he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II for his service in the arts. Uh, his character here, of course, is... Hannibal Lecter. I, uh, I think whoever wrote this. Uh, well, we know who wrote it, but just that name, just that name now, uh, kind of sends a chill up our spine. And so that was a very. I think there's something in names, by the way. Hannibal Lecter in *The Silence of the Lambs* is a pathological killer, murderer, a brilliant man of his field. Um, and of course, we know from watching the film uh, how brilliant that he really is. He's brilliant to the point of being intimidating. Uh, I will add to this, and it's on your handout, on your handout sheet, that this uh, particular Hannibal Lecter is an attempt uh, to bring about a, maybe the basis or the foundation, it was a true person that this is based on. Uh, he's based on an actual doctor who lives in Mexico. Uh, the articles that we read even gave his name, Al Alfredo Bali Tavino, who was convicted of murder and then chopping up his gay lovers. Um, going on with some of the uh, lesser, I shouldn't even say lesser actors, because they certainly put in their parts very well. Ted Levine. Ted Levine, um, you will know him mostly for his um, performance as Leland Stottlemyre on the TV hit series Monk. But he also played in Jurassic World and uh, The Alienist. I think this is one of the most, um, I, I don't understand why he didn't receive some kind of award. He may have, certainly not uh, not an Oscar, but he, he does something I think really great. We still quote him, by the way, at home. Uh, he, he says a lot of things in this movie that are quotable. He is, uh, he is Buffalo Bill in the, the Silence of the Lamb. He is a cross-dresser uh, who lures his victims into harm's way. Uh, he murders them and uses their skin to fulfill his de devilish needs. Um, he is an odd type character for sure, but something that we also need to understand that Buffalo Bill's character is a combination of three real life serial killers. One of course is Glenn Hydman. Hydman was a man that when he would kill his victims, he would put them in a pit or before he killed them, he'd put them in a pit. Oftentimes, he would put more than one person in the pit. Uh, so Hydman is known for that. Another ser serial killer uh, that helped create Buffalo Bill was someone that you might have uh, recognized. His name is Ted Bundy. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Ted Bundy days. Ted Bundy was a, um, a charismatic, handsome man who would lure his victims in by even faking uh, injuries and so on and so forth to put women in vulnerable situations. Ladies, let that be a lesson to you that sometimes people will have to be watched very carefully you will remember the scene when Buffalo Bill is trying to get the couch into the van. Then we see him with a broken arm or a pretended broken arm. So uh, we know that Ed Gain, one of the three monsters that is uh, 
used in this particular uh, creation of this guy. Ed Gaines, um, he had the, the evilness about him to use the skin of his victims to make wearable items. Ed Gaines' revolting and evil deeds were also models used in the movie Psycho and, of course, as Leatherface in the Chainsaw Massacre. So I thought there was some interesting details as we went through these uh, characters. Um, Scott Glenn, uh, his full name is Theodore Scott Glenn, is an American actor. Um, he played uh, Alan Shepard in The Right Stuff and Wes Hightower in The Urban Cowboy. Um, he's played a lot of roles. He is a very, very busy character actor. He uh, played one of the lesser roles in one of the movies we watched earlier, which was Apocalypse Now. His character in Silence of the Lamb is Agent Jack Crawford. We'll probably be talking some about him. He is, of course, the FBI agent that recruits uh, Carice Starling in the FBI agent in training uh, to, to interview uh, Hannibal Lecter. Uh, we understand that Agent Crawford is the overseer of the Buffalo Bill case and needs Lecter's information to find the killer of Buffalo Bill. Just one note, we might want to remember that um, Hannibal Lecter knows who Mr. Crawford is. He mentions him in the early interview with Miss Starling. Anthony Harold is an American actor who played the assistant principal Scott Gruber in public in Boston Public. Um, he played Dr. Frederick Chilton. I think he's a, got a great small part here, but it's very important. Uh, he, he also uh, played this role in The Red Dragon. Um, so Dr. Frederick Chilton is played by Anthony Harold. Um, I find that uh, from what I know about the characters, that Dr. Chilton is a very prideful man who enjoys the thought of having a man as powerful as Hannibal Lecter in his mental uh, facility. His uh, attitude toward Lecter comes back to bite him in the end. Uh, pun intended, by the way. <laughs> because, uh, he, uh, well, we know what happens maybe if we look on in. So when you got a cast of people like this, these great actors, you got these characteristic actors that are famous. You have a plot and you have a screen to play going on. You've got to have a director that can put all of this together. Um, some films probably would have been greater had they had greater uh, director. For Jonathan Demme, he uh, won an Academy Award for Silence of the Lamb. And he is, uh, he is accredited with uh, movies such as Philadelphia, Stop Making Sense, and the list goes on and on. He is a director that as I watched this film, I thought that he was, um, he was a very good director in this. Screenplay was by Ted Talley. He won an, also won uh, an Academy Award for Silence of the Lamb. He also wrote screen, screenplays for Red Dragon, White Palace, and all the pretty horses. Final notes, and then we'll get into some conversation here. The Silence of the Lamb is only one of three movies to win five Oscars. The other two were It Happened One Night in 1934, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in 1975. So I wanted to come up with some interesting things. So I want to go down the list and you can see the list of fun facts and then we're going to get into themes uh, and, and that type of thing, but I don't want to miss these. Uh, and I want your comments on them as we go down and look at a couple of these. The first one uh, I, um, that we see was Jodie Foster and uh, Anthony Hopkins were not the first choices for the roles that they played. Michelle Pfeiffer and Sean Connery were the first choices but both declined the parts. Um, I think it'd been very interesting to uh, hear Sean Connery uh, play that part. Sean Connery being a British actor with that um, 
with that dialect, I think it's kind of interesting that they also, secondly, was Anthony Hopkins. So apparently they wanted someone of that type of voice. What, what do you think about that? Anybody got a comment? I think they definitely had a vision for the kind of emotions a voice like that can evoke when it is twisted and when it is used in different ways. And I think that was, it would have been very interesting, as you said, Bill, to see Michelle Pfeiffer and Sean Connery in those <laughs> yeah. parts. Although I feel like those two actors, I feel like, you know how in some films you see an actor and it's not the character, it's the actor you see. I feel that if they would have made that choice, that could have possibly happened. While the actors that they did choose played um, Clarice and Hannibal spectacularly. Yeah, I, so I totally agree on that. I, I can't picture um, enjoying this movie as I did without Hannibal Lecter looking me directly in the eyes or without that wonderful accent that we are all so used to. Uh, I will say, Natasha, you feel free to jump in there if you'd like. So we want you to be part of the team here today. Uh, Jody Foster and Anthony Hopkins, as I said, did not have a conversation the entire time on the set because she said she was afraid of him. Did you find, a, did you find it easy to be afraid of Hannibal Lecter um, and his mannerisms? I would say if you were face to face with him, then yeah, I mean, he could be intimidating. Um, I've watched everything there is to watch on him, all the, the spin offs and everything else. So um, I really like him. I can't help it. I just like him. I did from the beginning. So, um, you know, I, I love the character, but I can guarantee that he would be very, um, you'd be untrustworthy of him because you wouldn't know what he was going to do next. And I think he'd be very intimidating, but um, I think he played this part well. I was watching something where it was talking about or reading something that said that Jodie Foster um, looked at him. I mean, it, Clarice looked at him as if he was kind of like her, that he didn't, mm. um, you know, he wasn't like a, this big, huge, strong guy. Like his middle finger on his left hand looked like it had been surgically put on there and you know how he had done his own plastic surgery a couple times that he had smaller teeth that he was like some a bit of a, a weaker man in stature so um even though looking at him he's not this big burly guy he, i think that he's still very intimidating just because of who he is and how he speaks i agree with you there crystal 100 percent. and i think that one of the things that really makes hannibal so intimidating is his intelligence because a lot of the times when you, especially in the real world, when you encounter serial killers and just evil people, a lot of the times they aren't very intelligent. There are some cases where they are, but a lot of the times you don't face that. And it leaves you to think, you know, someone with that kind of malicious evil intentions and the intellect to execute that is terrifying to think about. And I personally found myself feeling frightened by this movie because of the personalization I had by um, Clarice's accent. You know, I could literally envision myself in the movie and it really put me into it on another level. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, we'll uh, tell you that there is a movie, um, it's called The Edge. It's Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin that is one of my favorite, but I like movies like that. And he is, uh, he plays a billionaire in the movie and he had married a young lady. It's a pretty interesting movie if you like uh, adventure type movies, it's a really good one. Here's a note that you may um, be interested in. The film had a $19 million budget. Uh, I know we don't talk about this very often, but I thought it was intriguing that at the box office, it brought in nearly $273 million. Um, I think that's fascinating. Um, the film grossed enough money in the first week in theaters to pay for the movie entirely. That says something about not only the movie itself, but also the advertising production and so on and so forth. Uh, moving on down uh, rather quickly, um, 
uh, if you'll go down a few spaces, the Silence of the Lamb was a smash that became the first horror film to win a Best, uh, best Picture Oscar. I thought that was fascinating. That's like that this movie, it, it, um, it turned some heads and, and made some things happen. So these were just fun facts. And um, you, you, um, I, I just thought they were interesting to present today. Something that we can uh, like, I, I do want to read the third one up from the bottom. And in preparation for this film, for his role in the film, Anthony Hopkins, studied uh, files of serial killers. Also, he visited prisons and studied convicted murders and was uh, present during court hearings concerning um, grotesque murders and serial killers. So he's the kind of guy that is the, the actor that wants to uh, make sure that he's doing what is supposed to be done. And he certainly portrayed that correctly. Uh, that goes along with the next one down too, by the way. Uh, he had a dear friend of his who uh, had a problem that he wouldn't blink when he spoke. And it said it was unnerving to people around him. Did you notice, did anyone notice in the film that Anthony Hopkins did not blink when he spoke? And was it unnerving? I personally did. I, this is going to sound very strange, but I used to be a very backwards, very shy person. And uh, I did a lot of research on a lot of psychology and a lot of social um, communication, things like body language. And one day I decided that I was not going to be the shy person anymore and that I would look every person I ever spoke to in the eye. Mm. And I, wow. I noticed that immediately because I notice it in my day-to-day -day life. If I speak to someone and I see that they're not wanting to keep eye contact with me, I kind of know that they're a shy person or that they're a little bit timid. And with this, I just felt matched. Like I was staring down um, Hannibal and I was like, yeah, I would be intimidated by this person. And, and that's something this film brings out in us, I think, Nicole. It, it begins from the beginning we start analyzing everything in this movie. Um, you remember that when Carice was watching down, walking down the corridor and she has to walk by those three prisoners to get to Hannibal Lecter's um, place of living. Um, you, you began, as soon as you see Hannibal Lecter and he's standing there in that uh, pose that almost at attention you begin to analyze everything that's going on. And I think that's something that this class has taught us. I'll never, and I've said this before in our class, I don't believe that I'll ever watch a movie again um, the way I used to watch them. Uh, I just so more, I enjoy movies so much more now. Um, what was your thought when they were doing the autopsy and they got the, the gentleman, uh, well, she looks at the picture um, Miss Starling does and said there's something in his throat, correct? And so they take the um, tweezers and he goes down and he works around and he brings out this. It's the first sight we have of the cocoon and he brings it out. Is, was that a little unnerving to any of you all? Well, no, it was I, to me. I liked it. I mean, <laughs> I thought that it added that, that extra um, underlying kind of detail you know like um buffalo bill he's something that he wants to transform into something else so that that goes with that theme of the movie <clears throat> excuse me we kind of all are you know she was pretending to be like she was some special agent and she was still just in training and um you know he's of course Hannibal is at all costs kind of analyzing everyone, but everyone seems to be something that they're transforming into something else. You know, she's this young rookie uh, going through the, um, the academy and then she's blossoming into being a special agent and already blossom, you know, opening up and becoming something beautiful in, and even Jack Crawford's eyes, you know, I think that he sees a lot in her.
So, yes. I mean, I thought that it went a lot with the theme of the movie. I liked it. And it certainly does. And it, it tags along throughout the movie, as we see. Just wanted to bring that bulletin up and let you know that it was uh, uh, it was made, the cocoon was made out of a combination of Tootsie Rolls and gummy bears. So, uh, you know, if they would have accidentally swallowed it, then they would have been okay. Um, so as we get through, as we start going through the movie and we begin to talk about it, I'd like to discuss, if we could, about cameras and camera angles before we go into our themes to consider because I believe that, uh, I think it was Corey that wrote something very intriguing about the cameras and how that they are part of this movie. And I'd like to think about, it's like teamwork and the camera was part of the team that we're, we're looking at. What part of the movie or was there anything that stood out to you guys that that you saw the camera doing, that the camera was the star of it. And is there anything you can share with us that brings the camera into complete focus here? Can y'all hear me? Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm not even glad to go. <laughs> I was going to say, I wrote that um, the close-ups on, is it Clarice? Clarice? It's hard for me to say yes. that word, say her name, but on her close-ups and Hannibal Lecter, it almost gave the viewer, like, made them subconsciously compare their emotions because it, the camera close-ups were meant for us to see their feelings in the scene, in that particular scene, and I felt like it, it emphasized the lack of emotion for Hannibal Lecter, and it, like, mm. meant for us to compare, compare them two together. That's how I seen it. Yes. I like I like that thought. I had noticed the close-ups just where they get right up in their face and you you basically all you get in that frame is their forehead to their chin <laughs> and um, that really kind of drove home kind of that unnerving creepiness of Anthony Hopkins. Yes. And I wish I would have noticed the blinking thing but maybe that's part of what creeps me out so bad about his character <laughs> is I didn't really consciously pick up on that but definitely those close-ups um really drove that home the fact they're looking directly into the camera so yeah good call, i man. agree with you there it translated to me mm -hmm. almost the anxiety and the intensity that clarice had at this because this was really her first big shot and she would have been so focused and so honed in on every little detail that she could have gotten from hannibal and i really felt like the camera was almost trying to replicate her gaze and put us in her mindset. And I think it did so wonderfully. During that particular early scene, the first scene where Hannibal Lecter and Starling are together, um, some of the things that I read was that they were jockeying for position. Hannibal was, and he succeeded at being more powerful than she was. If you'll notice in it, and I think Corey brought this out in his uh, thread, that when you saw her, you saw her from the shoulders up, you saw her shoulders and her head. When Anthony Hopkins was in the camera's lens, you saw just his face. And what that did was that was showing a that he was a little bit superior in this early bout they were having. Now, as, um, as we also saw in this, we see that Anthony Hopkins makes a statement. He says, sit down, Grace. What's she do? She sits down and gives him an upper angle on it, and the camera gives you that. I thought that was so great. The camera was showing us what he saw, that he was looking down on her. That's what he was trying to accomplish. And he does that. There's even something in business that I've read years ago that a man that had a real uh, problem with his ego would always make sure that he had the higher seat than anyone that came in to visit him in the office. There's a, there's a distinction of power there. So I think the camera did a marvelous job in that uh, Corey, can you uh, maybe give us some insight on 
what you um, what you put in your uh, your thread. Yeah, uh, we may be here all class though. That's fine, buddy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I absolutely loved just this was the first time where I noticed the cinematography, like hardcore noticed what was going on, and it was all during the interview scenes, like. <clears throat> Like when Bill said, uh, she'd tell her to sit down and then he would stand up and he would move around and like him, him moving around shows that like he's the one that's uh, the more comfortable one in the situation and the camera's pointed up towards him. Mm -hmm. Uh, The fact that uh, when you're looking at Clarice, you see the background, you have something to take your eyes off of if you're uncomfortable. But when it goes straight back to Heck, uh, Hannibal, almost call him Hector. When it goes straight back <laughs> Hector to Hector Hannibal, <clears throat> yeah. uh, you look, you just see his eyes. You see his eyes or you see his entire face. And it's like, not only does he take up more space, which kind of alludes to him having more power, but it also is like, you can't, if you are uncomfortable with him not blinking, not stare. You can't look away from that. You have nothing to look at but his face. It's like so commanding. It's so in your face, literally. It's just, it's really good. It was, yeah, I could go on, but I'd just be repeating myself. But yeah, I just, I loved seeing that. And then also, just real quick, there's one part where she's like, uh, tell me the answer. And then it's from inside Hannibal's room, the camera is, and it's looking at her. And she <laughs> said, tell me the answer. And then he walks in and you see his reflection. And I loved that. I seen that and I was like, oh my God, that's such a good shot. That is such a good shot. Because you get to see both of their faces. And real quick, the fact that they look inside the camera, like 99 times out of 100, you will hear a director, well, you won't even hear a director say it because the actors will just know you're not supposed to look at the camera. The camera's just there, but you're supposed to be looking somebody else in the eyes or whatever, but having Hannibal look the camera straight in the eyes, basically staring you down and having Clarice staring you down It's just, it's unnerving because you're not used to that. I don't know if there's been a single movie we've watched all semester where an actor directly looks into the camera, especially during an intense scene like this. Right. Those are all great, great points, Corey. Go ahead. To build off what Corey said, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is is the scene where they talk about like the screaming of the lambs and, and whatnot. Like the to build off the point about the camera one of my one of the great things about that scene is the camera actually goes behind remember when we talked about chinatown we talked about how polanski used the camera like to get a behind the shoulder look yes from jack nicholson's perspective it's very much the same thing so when whenever hannibal was talking we actually get a first person perspective through hannibal's eyes at Clarice, which invites us to psychoanalyze Clarice mm-hmm. at the same time that he is. So put this movie literally puts you through the monster's eyes, so to speak, during yes. that during that scene, which I've always found interesting. Yeah, that's one of my favorite scenes also. Um I tell you the camera plays a lot of a lot of wonderful parts in this. One more I'll I'll allude to. I don't want to labor it too much. But I think it's very important that we that we see this when Clarice goes into um, Crawford's office for the first time. She goes in. He's not there. He'll be along in a little while. She goes in. She's looking around, and suddenly she sees Buffalo Bill's name on the board. And she sees all these articles. Well, how does she see those? She sees them with her eyes. How do we see them? We see them with the camera. And then the last shot or close to the last shot in that little scene, you see in the background, 
Mr. Crawford's head over on her left shoulder. And it's, fa it's, it's kind of fuzzed out, but you can see him. And it, it brought about to me that she was being analyzed by not only Hannibal Lecter, but she was being analyzed by Agent Crawford also, um, perhaps to guide her in her, her, um, her professional career. So yeah, the camera has an, it's, it's an awesome thing and it certainly brings us to the themes to consider. There's a lot of themes in this movie, I believe. I wrote down four, we wanna look at a couple of these. Um, Starling is a woman trying to succeed in a man's world. Now that's my statement. You may not agree with that. And if you don't, that's fine. We can talk about it. And she is striving to rise above her humble beginnings, which was, of course, we know that she was a young lady uh, from the hills of West Virginia or Virginia. Um, does Cur Curry's, um, is she trying to work her way through a man's world? And how hard was it for her to be successful in the FBI in 1991? Let me, uh, I'm like, Natasha, I'd like for you to talk about this question because you have a very similar career choice as our character, right? You want to talk about, you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, I, I wasn't sure if Dr. Yeager had told you guys, I'm a police officer and um, I, I think I maybe identified with Clarice a bit more than the average person just because of that. Um, a lot of the things that she went through and a lot of the comments that she received, I received too, going through my mm -hmm. training. And even nowadays, you know, I'll go on a call and I'll have people request a male officer. They don't want to talk to me. They want to talk to a male. And um, that was a recurring theme throughout the entire movie. I thought was basically her identity was a woman was background in every single shot. Um, the way that men spoke to her, the way that men spoke around her, the um, kinds of, I guess the kinds of situations she was put in that would make any female uncomfortable in my opinion. Um, she was very isolated. And I, I totally agree with that statement that part of this movie was her journey through that male dominated field and kind of getting her feet under her with kind of that working against her, if that makes sense. Natasha, is there a, is there a, is, is it possible that sometimes there could be a bitterness that tags along with that because of positions that women are being put in today? I think, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I think I felt that. Um, you, you kind of feel like you're already working, you're already swimming against the current and that's just an extra thing that you have to deal with, I suppose. So class with that thought, do we think that, uh, Carice may have had a problem with that also, that there may have been some bitterness in her or, or maybe bitterness, is not the right word. Certainly okay. challenges probably would be the word, maybe disappointment even. As you know, we entered these fields. Go ahead. Sorry about that, Bill. No, go thank ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your insight on that, Natasha. I would have never, honestly, I never realized that women in law enforcement face things that frequently and to that extent. But um, your question, Bill, I feel like me personally, if I was in that situation, I would feel bitter because I would look at it as I had put in the same amount of work <clears throat> at the academy as the rest of these men. And that me being a female, being a woman, does not change my work ethic, my experience, my uh, abilities or anything of that. And I felt almost, to bring in another little note here, I felt almost as if Clarice was put on this project and uh, thrown into the field at this point. One, to confuse Hannibal. I think mm. it was totally a tactic of throwing him off his guard and setting him off in some way. And I also feel that they chose a woman for this role because if she failed, it could be blamed on her being a woman and not blamed on the agency itself. I see that she um, had to work a little harder, prove herself a little more than maybe a male. Um, you know, for instance, whenever they are at the um, funeral home, 
in West Virginia, and he's trying to smooth it over with that mm -hmm. um, sheriff. And he says, you know, kind of acts like he doesn't want Clarice overhearing what they're saying. I believe that that could have been like two things. He could have been smoozing and smoothing over with that sheriff, but he could also have been testing her to see how she was going to react to things like that because he knew that that's the kind of stuff that she would face. And instead, she handled it well. She walked into the room. When they get in there with the corpse, she sets her foot down and is like, hey, I'm ready to get to work. You guys are going to get out of here. And then she handled him whenever they're in the vehicle going back to D.C. You know, hey, why did you do that to me? You know that they're going to follow you. They're going to follow your lead. If you show me disrespect, they're going to show me disrespect. So I think she handled that and really impressed him in how she handled that. She didn't trip out right then. She didn't get all emotional about it. She handled it in a proper manner. And I believe that, that she definitely had to prove herself a little more than what other people did. Hmm. Very good. Um, I had uh, read something that Ryan said here. I want to bring this up too. You know, you try to perceive what we think of Hannibal Lecter. Um, then the question would come, what does he think of himself? We, well, some of us think that he was kind of like a monster. Uh, at least that's what the doctor said he was. It was a monster. Uh, I want to read something that Ryan said. He says, I don't think Hannibal Lecter thinks of himself as a mon monster. And he goes on to say, I think Lecter thinks of himself as a man with higher thinking than those around him. What's your thoughts on that? Do you think that Hannibal Lecter thought himself to be some kind of monster man or is, is Ryan correct in, in that maybe Lecter's mentality is high above anyone he's, he's around? I have to agree with Ryan on this one, Bill. I feel like Hannibal, a lot of times very, very, very intelligent people find themselves in situations where they have ego problems and they can be a bit mm -hmm. egotistical. And it's something that those people have to address within themselves. And I feel like Hannibal would have viewed himself as someone who didn't allow morals to stop his intelligence and yeah. didn't allow those to get in the way of his progress or whatever you could call it. I feel like that's how he viewed it. I don't think he would have viewed himself as a monster. I think he would have viewed that idea of himself as overly emotional and illogical. Although I personally think he's a monster. <laughs> I'll say this. Welcome back, Nicole. We missed you. Yes, we have. <laughs> I love your comments. They're great. And everybody's is. Uh, let's go to a theme to consider number two. Uh, Hannibal Lecter psychoanalyzes Carice and helps bring to the surface the fears and struggles of her past. Yet Hannibal is uh, oblivious to his own evil heart and his lack of normalcy. Do you think that he really did bring some of her problems to the surface? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would argue so. I mean, um, you know, that, that whole scene, like if you, if you study psychoanalysis really deeply, like Freudian or Lacanian, like, I don't know how much you guys have had experience with that type of psychoanalysis in your psychology courses, but he, he pretty much follows to a T with, with Lacanian psychology. You know, he figures out, you know, he figures out her deepest trauma, right? He figures out, usually whenever you talk of a, of a trauma in Lacanian psychoanalysis, you usually have some type of like symbol that symbolizes your trauma. Which in this case, it's the, it's the it's the lambs and the screaming of the lambs. And so, uh, I've I've always thought that scene is was extremely good writing, very very good psychological psych writing there. So psychoanalysis is different than a lot of modern psychology. And psychoanalysis is all about getting to the deep rooted issue of whatever problem it is you're having right whereas a lot of more modern psychology is more based on chemical reactions and and 
getting the right medications, right? Well, classic psychoanalysis is actually getting to the root of whatever bothers you. So it's hard, to, there. it's hard to argue that he's not a great psychologist. Right. I agree with you there, Dr. Yeager. And I feel that he used, he brought up these subconscious fears and these uh, traumas that she had hidden as a way to deter her from her goal and from the case. And I felt that surpassing consent in that, like psychoanalyzing someone in person without their consent, I think is kind of an asshole thing to do <laughs> personally. Um, I don't know how I'd react if someone like met me and they were like, oh, how do you feel about this? And they were like, oh, what about that? What about the screaming of the lambs? I'd be like, buddy, that's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> you you think, remember? Go ahead, Kristen. I think that... Um, that <laughs> Jack Crawford actually kind of used um, Hannibal in a couple of ways. And I think that he knew that he would psychoanalyze her, especially whenever he found out she was a trainee. Mm. And I believe that he used that so that he could figure out what was going on with her. He could get to the, to the root of her because he's seen something special in her and he needed to know, he needed to put her through all these tests and she ended up, I think way exceeding what he thought that she was going to be. But I think that that's one reason he sent her there. And he told her, you know, make sure you don't get personal. Cause he knew that that's what was going to happen. He knew that Hannibal would get in her head and, you know, maybe that was another test. I just feel like that, <laughs> that Crawford was a very intelligent man. You know, he's the one that was behind getting Hannibal put behind bars. I think he was a very intelligent man. For him to be able to track Hannibal, he had to be able to know how Hannibal thought and how he was going to react. So I believe that he knew how he would react once he figured out and he would be able to read her like that to know that she was not an experienced special agent. And I think that he used that to his advantage in a couple of ways. Mm, very good. Um, I don't, uh, before we go into uh, theme number uh, three here, um, I want to uh, go to discretion question number six that uh, was posted. And I want to get some insight on this. It says, in the scene where Clarice is in Buffalo Bill's house, the power goes out. Describe what is taking place. What elements of filmmaking are present with this dark scene do you notice any mistakes and does the sound now play a greater role? So we want to go into that scene. She first of all gets in the house and they have a confrontation or they have a, a, a discussion. They have a dialogue. He's looking for his card or a card of, myth of the lady that she was looking for. And then suddenly something happens to her face. She gets this look on her face as though I know where I am. Now, somebody help me and take me through that scene when the lights go out. Anybody brave enough? I can help, get us, I can help get us started here. Okay, sounds good. Like the theme of coveting that you mentioned. Yes. The movie. You know, now that we have this dark scene, a lot of that is through Buffalo Bill's eyes. So we finally kind of get to see like what he sees and so much of what makes his character, uh, his character, I suppose, is his desire to transform and be something different than he is. So Getting her through his eyes, I think, is an extremely important thing to breaking down that character for sure. Okay. Anybody else? Did you notice when he has the night vision goggles on and she's there with that gun and you notice the sound she's breathing? It's, it's very dramatic. You ever been in a place of fear? She's in a place of fear. Notice too that he, you can see his hand come from the goggles and he's almost like he wants to touch her, but he doesn't. But he has power here. 
He has the power to touch her. He has the power to be greater than she is. And then, of course, what else do we see? Uh, if you'll notice, if you go back and watch this, I asked that if there was any m mistakes. Remember that it's very dark. It's pitch dark. And you can see a shadow on her back, which would not be there if there was no light. So it's just a, a flaw in, the, in, 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 in it that I thought was very, very interesting. So he is there with her. He can take her out at any time. He has this power over her. But what happens then? Her training comes into play and she hears something. Does anybody want to tell us what she heard? Are you talking the cocking, about? The cocking of the gun. What did she do? What did her training tell her to do? She fired. He unloaded on in the direction that she heard the sound, and that's how she got him with a kill shot. Absolutely. So she used her training and all those things that she had been taught in order to be superior over him. So here's my question. Why did she go into that house in the first place? You think that was a wise move on her part? She didn't realize she was going into the, the house of Buffalo Bill. She thought she was getting information on the woman that had lived there that was a seamstress. So for her to walk through the, the door while he's doing that, I mean, you can kind of look at that a couple of different ways. I mean, are you going to call for backup, Natasha, if you're just getting a, somebody's digging for a, a business card? I mean, if, if it's an old lady, and until she's seen that, um, those butterflies landing, and she's seen the things, all these different things that came in and reminded her of exactly who Buffalo Bill was, because she was told to study that case file. If you'll remember, Jack Crawford asked her, what do you see? What do you think? So she had to go through and analyze him just by reading it. So whenever all of this stuff comes to life for her, she realized where she was at that point in time. But I mean, I don't believe personally that whenever she first walked in that she, she was at risk. At, okay. And I totally agree. And when she, when she did know where she was, why didn't she leave then? There's a, there, I think there's a reason that she didn't leave. Well, she knew that he had uh, cash. Uh -huh. Right. And, and suddenly, when he ducks out of the way after she pulls the gun, she hears the lamb crying. I mean, she hears the governor's daughter or the senator's daughter crying out, right? Mm -hmm. So she did that out of duty for one. And two, I think Cannibal was right. He's trying to silence those lambs. Okay, so back to theme to consider number three, and we don't have much time left, but let's look at this. Buffalo Bill is an individual who covets what he cannot have. His inner being is trying to evolve from an evil monster to something beautiful. You think that's an accurate statement about Buffalo Bill? I think so. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, let me frame this discussion about buffalo bill like there's okay. there's a there's a big conversation about this character especially in the lgbt community like some people think that this is kind of a really bad way to to write like a trans character like buffalo so does buffalo bill sort of embody like different fears that we might have that people might have about the trans community that's a that's a whole dialogue within the movie right because they talk about how like a, a lot of trans people were very docile you know they're not aggressive like he is so the movie tries to almost you know throw that off 
but I, I've read lots of literature on this movie and lots of people like heavily criticize this movie because of this character. I'm, I'm curious to know, especially what you guys have to say about that. You know, that had never really jumped out at me during watching the film. I'm, I really am going to have to rewatch and really watch for that. Um, one thing that I think about Buffalo Bill, I felt that as a transgender person, I believe like, you know, a man wanting to transition to a woman, transgender woman, he had so much internalized misogyny is what I felt. And I really felt hatred towards the other women that he was taking advantage of and brutalizing and murdering. That's what I felt. And I think that not just for trans people or for any members of the LGBTQ community, for a lot of people, that is something that we encounter. You know, if we see something that for some reason is denied us, there can be a lot of anger there. Like sometimes I will see people with pretty privilege who, you know, because they are physically and stereotypically beautiful, can get further in life simply on that. And I think, why do I have to work harder just because I am not the social idea of beautiful drop dead gorgeous. And it makes me angry sometimes. And I think that while this is definitely a discussion about transgender people and about the fears that society has about them, this is also a discussion about how you behave when you are in a position of disadvantage in society. You know, did uh, did Hannibal Lecter tell Carice that uh, Buffalo Bill was not a true transgender? He did, yeah. He was trying to be something, um, but he, that's when he made the statement that Buffalo Bill covets. Yeah. That's a lot in the Yeah, the, I guess the layer, back in the 90s, they thought gender was more like your genitalia, right? More than what you identified with. So that's why the, the the hospital refused to give Buffalo Bill the surgery, right? So so by modern standards, he would be considered trans because that's what he identifies himself as. But in the nineties when this movie was made, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have had that um, understanding. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does to me. Um, it seems to me like, like if I, if they remade this today, like uh, Silence of the Lambs doesn't exist in the '90s, and they re and they made it today, I would just say not have a character that happens to maybe be trans, maybe not, and just avoid that whole issue. But it does seem like kind of more forward, like than. I don't know. It's hard to put my thoughts into it, but it seems more forward thinking than I would imagine it being because, uh, well, maybe it's not, I don't know. It's a little of both because it's saying that like, it kind of pushes this idea that, uh, trans people are mentally disturbed that they, uh, that there is something wrong with them. They're dealing with their trauma, their childhood trauma in some sort of way that makes them want to be a different gender. And that's, that's pretty harmful. But at the same time, it also pushes against this idea of this person just happens to be demented. It doesn't mean uh, that their gender identity has anything to do with it. It doesn't mean that this person, I don't know. I'm thinking out loud, honestly, because I'm really I see where you're coming from, Corey. It's like this person is demented and happens to be trans. Like, and it's hard, especially for this class, because while we are a very diverse class, I don't think we have a lot of LGBTQ diversity. And it's hard for us to really get a full spectrum of this because we don't really know how others would view it if they would view any kind of representation as good representation, or if they would view this as completely bad and completely negative. I think it really just depends on individuals and how they view it, because 
every movie is different for every individual. We will all see different things and we will all, you know, really pinpoint different themes of the movie that stand out to us. Well, I see the only part about him being transgender is that um, he's trying to get these skins, you know, this beautiful big skin so that he can make his own <laughs> his own transformation. I don't think that it's saying that transgender people are off in the head. I don't believe that. Um, because if that's the case, then what, all intelligent people are psychopath serial killers that eat people? <laughs> all, all little girls that their daddy was killed in the line of duty, they're, um, you know, the way that Clarice is, you, you can't, you can't really, I mean, you can be dogmatic about it either way that you go, but I don't believe that that was, me personally, I don't believe that that was what they were going for. I think that's why people are so upset about it, because it wasn't, concentrated on that wasn't I don't believe that was why that they made Buffalo Bill the way he was I don't believe that that was saying hey if you're transgender you're a freak you're not whatever no I don't, I don't believe that I think that that was just for the purpose of him skinning people and that was just his backstory let me that's me, what me. makes it or you go sorry I was what makes it my internet cut out anyways i was just gonna say that's what makes it so difficult can y'all hear me yes yes okay that's what makes it so difficult is like it's not one or the other it's not 100 percent saying uh this person is demented because they're trans or they're trans because they're demented and it's also not uh not like a woke 2021 movie either it's like somewhere in the middle it's like if the if the idea that they were trying to push is this person is trans or this person is demented because they are trans if this person is a weird serial killer because they are trans or vice versa if they try to make that correlation i feel like it would be clearer i agree with you there Corey. and i think that at the time this movie came out especially a lot of women maybe I can't speak for anyone at the time but I think it would definitely make sense for a lot of women to feel threatened in a way to you know have a big part of their identity encroached upon I guess some people could view it because you know we I personally view men not all men I don't want to generalize but a lot of men as having a lot more privileges than me without even knowing it. And, you know, it's not an intentional thing. It's a societal thing. And, you know, seeing someone want to, in a way, maintain that male privilege while gaining the few privileges that women have can be threatening, I think. And I think at the time, it probably definitely was prevalent for that to be a feeling that this movie evoked. And I think that today we view it very differently. At the time, Nicole, there wasn't a whole lot of people coming out. That wasn't, um, that was just starting. I mean, if we remember back when, um, you guys probably don't remember this, back when Ellen came out and she, here she was an actress. And then when she came out and they were canceling shows and, and all of that, I mean, it was majorly frowned upon. It's not accepted as it is today. And that's not been that long ago because I mean, I was just like in high school or something. <laughs> but this, people were just starting to come out. They, um, it was, it was a sore subject. Uh, but do I think that people were just flat out being like, okay, well, if, if you're that, you're, you're crazy and you're going to kill people to get what you want. I mean, maybe some people, of course, you've got dogmatic people on every subject line, but I don't believe that, um, that this was portraying it that way. One of the I agree with you, Crystal. At the time, like, I wasn't alive then. I really don't know. At the time, was there a lot of fear, even though that, the, that that wasn't a prevalent subject and it really wasn't huge in society, was there fear surrounding that subject? Like, maybe not necessarily them being crazy, but just any kind of fear maybe of uh, 
not understanding un- it. Yeah, and the unknown yeah. and lack of understanding for sure. And people were, I mean, it was a fear for the people coming out, and it was a fear for people who um, had nothing to do with it because they were like, oh God, <laughs> you know, I can't be friends with him or her. They'll try to turn me gay or they'll try to, <laughs> this, um, honestly, that's, yeah, that's how true. it was. So, I mean, you just, you had um, views that went from one spectrum to the next. I mean, there really wasn't a a medium or, I don't know, I guess a an accepted way to go. It was very new. It was very strange to people. It was, um, it was ignorance on the, the fact of, of both because, you know, they didn't know um, whenever they were trying to come out, they didn't know how that was going to be accepted. They didn't really even know how they felt about it because they weren't allowed to freely live that way. And then the people that, that weren't gay or wasn't um, transsexual, I mean, they were coming out. It, it was ignorance. It was no education on it at all. So well, I think are, that's what made it so strange need, or whatever. We, yeah, we need to remember, though, that the writers... They came up with this character from three serial killers. So he's put these in a melting pot and came up with his own thought on what would work for this movie. Apparently that worked for this movie. And so uh, we have five minutes. So we want to uh, look at one other issue that I think is very important. Bill, real quick. I just want to know. Ahead. I just want to sure. know everybody. You can't talk about this movie without talking about that scene. All right, you guys know the scene that I'm talking about with Buffalo Bill, right? Where he's where he does he puts his lipstick on and he does his dance, right? He he does his little tuck, right? He plays that song "Goodbye Horses," right? That that song will be forever burned in your head now that you've watched this movie if you've never watched this movie before. What did you guys think of that scene, especially in conjunction with this conversation we're we're having? That's exactly where I was going to good, because, good. yeah, because, and you know, he goes through this kind of ritual and he's happy. I mean, he's going through it. And then we also see as he goes through and he makes sure his eye makeup is on correctly and so on and so forth. And when he's leaning over the pit, he's telling her after he, she find he finds out that the puppy's down there. He's saying, you know, put the puppy in the basket in a real calm he says that three or four times, and then suddenly he comes out, and he, he uses some vulgarity and says, put the puppy in the back, and so he does that, and we see both sides of him there, but yeah, it's intriguing. He's really into the moment, isn't he? Yeah, I think we see a different side of him. We see a um, one that he's accepted himself when he is in in that form and that form of himself he feels accepting of himself not anybody else accepting him but him himself so and like dad said you know whenever he he does flip that switch very quickly but um he was happy in that moment yeah okay before we end today um we, we have to ask this question because I think it's the cent- one of the central parts um, of this, and I'll say it. Dr. Frederick Chilton, the medical warden at the prison where Hannibal is housed, called Dr. Lecter a monster. So with that thought, what makes Hannibal so compelling and scary? I think it's the fact that he's smarter than you. And you know he's smarter than you. I agree with you there, Corey. I think it's his ability to analyze you and to understand you in a way that you might not even understand yourself. He can be one step ahead of you mentally, emotionally, everything. And I think that is terrifying. What did you guys think of the part of the movie where he broke out of the prison? Loved it. Oh my God, that's another twist ending or another twist that I loved when he's in the ambulance 
my sister came in right when that scene was going on and they put him into the ambulance or when they saw the body on top of the elevator. I said, uh, if you want to watch this movie later, shield your eyes, but I don't, I'm not believing what this movie is telling me. <laughs> and I, I didn't know exactly how, but I knew it was going to be uh, flipped on me somehow. <laughs> and then when I saw the body start to move in the ambulance, I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, well, hey, listen, everyone, I want to, before I hand it over to Dr. Yeager, I uh, want to thank you so much for your comments, and Nicole, we're glad you're back for sure, and Natasha, thank you for coming and being with us. I think all of us would welcome your comments, and they were wonderful, as always. Uh, appreciate everybody that helps out. You, this is, this thing of, you know, what we do to present it can be very difficult and there's a lot of work that goes into it. And without the cooperation of the whole team, you know, it could have been a flop today. And, and, and of course, everyone that was before me did wonderful work and did a wonderful job. Uh, but it, it's, it's a team thing. And uh, I just want to say that I really appreciate everyone helping me because, you know, Crystal will tell you that there's times that my brain can go into to lock and it'll lock up. So uh, I'm glad that you all bailed me out several times and appreciate the insight. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Yang. Thank you for that, Bill. You did a wonderful job. You done great, Dad. You did, you did. Uh, really quick, if I could share something since we're talking about a lot of serial killers and things like that. Uh, a family that went to my church uh, a couple years ago had previously lived in Utah and uh, I don't know if you all know, but Ted Bundy, I believe it was, for a while, went to Mormon churches, and they had actually met him and had dinner with him at their own home. Wow. Yeah. They said that when they found out everything, they were absolutely shocked, and they did yeah. not let anyone in their home for a long time. I heard that he was really, I've read and watched so many things on him, that he was really charismatic, and um, the people that had heard what had happened to him were totally shocked because that was not who they portrayed him to be at all. He was very, um, I guess, very well liked <laughs> that persona that he would put out there for you instead of the real him. You got to be a heck of a character to represent yourself in court without a lawyer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your presentation today. You did, you did very well. Thank you. Everybody's comments were great. I feel like we covered the whole movie in that hour and 15. I, I feel like we did. So. I think that's what I was afraid of uh, more than anything was that I didn't want to go so fast that we didn't get in depth on something. But I really think that this movie is so rich uh, with everything. And so I appreciate That's why I appreciate everybody putting in their comments for sure. Yeah, your point about this being the first horror film to win the Academy, an Academy Award, I mean, that's, that's something we've talked about our last couple of classes, too. Like, horror has never been treated as a high art form compared to noir or uh, high drama or even some comedies, right? It's, it's never been mm -hmm. as a high art form. So it just goes to show you that it can be. I mean, it's, it's interesting that this movie was taken more seriously than some others, like The Exorcist, for, for example. So I think the storyline is just so interesting, it's hard not to pay attention to it. Well, I mean, I've never heard somebody say, ooh, I hate that movie. No. <laughs> I mean, you could also classify this as a thriller, probably, if you wanted to get really specific. Instead of yeah, it was very suspenseful, this movie was. Right. I've never liked that category thriller. Like I've always associated that more with ho with horror. I don't like separating that as a separate category. That's just me though. Um, so for Thursday's class, we're watching The Lighthouse from 2019. This movie is a court. It is, we could thank Corey for giving us for talking about this movie. That's why I decided to change it. So uh, <laughs> can't wait to watch me some Robert Pattinson. 
Yeah, or it's, <laughs> it's only got two characters in it: Robert Pattinson and William Dafoe. Like this, this whole movie is this psychological analysis of so like going insane slowly, right? So uh, it's in That's black and white. It's in black and white. It's a 2019 movie, purposefully made in black and white. So I'll be interested to hear what you guys have to say about that. As well as these characters and this idea of madness and going insane. It's very, for the two of you who are in my other class, it's very, love, this is a very Lovecraftian movie. So I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Um, so it, it's, it's a treat. Robert Eggers is our director, and he has a very slow, sort of slow burn directing style. Corey's talked about it before with his other movie, The Witch. Mm. Uh, it'll be a good time. I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing it. And Kirsten said at the beginning of class, it's on Amazon Prime. If you want to, yeah. if you have that, you can watch it on there. All right. So that should be it for today. We'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. 2019 film, Dr. Yeager? Yeah, 2019. So it's on Amazon Prime and 2019 The Lighthouse? Yeah, that's what Kirsten said. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And you don't have to rent it. It's actually included with Prime. Sweet. All right. Thanks, Natasha, for coming in today. Yeah. Having me. That was fun. It's good yeah. to see you again. Yeah, you too. All right.